so thankful to see so many beautiful faces, so many faces I haven't seen in a long time. Every single week, we start seeing different faces show up. So that's awesome. It's so great. So, But I want to get into the Word of God this morning. I believe that God has something for us. How many know that God has something for me? I don't know about you. Just as much as God speaks to you when I preach or when anyone speaks, God speaks to me as well. And I came to hear a word from God. Amen? Today, all I'm doing is transferring what he's given me. And so I'm, I'm receiving today with you. So if you could stand one more time as we get ready to read the word of God. And if you could open your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. We're going to look at two scriptures. One's going to be Luke chapter 18, verse 35. And we're going to go all the way up to 42. And then the second one is going to be 1 John. Not the Apostle John, but 1 John um, 5, verse 4. And if you're on your, your Bible apps, you want to do NIV version for Luke, and you want to do ESV for John. And you can also follow along here. We're going to have it here as well. So you can do that as well. And it says like this. It says, Jesus, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith. Somebody say, your faith. Turn over to your neighbor. Say, your faith will heal you. Now, First John chapter 5 verse 4 for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world that's good right there in this season isn't that good news in this season for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world this is the victory that has overcome the world Somebody say, our faith. Somebody say, my faith. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We know it's alive, active, piercing through our hearts, Lord. We just ask, Lord God, that we open our minds to hear, Lord God, what you want to deposit today, Father. If there's somebody sick today, Lord, we declare healing in Jesus' name. If someone, Lord God, right now is suffering through mental or emotional oppression, right now, Lord God, we ask for chains to be broken, for deliverance, Lord God, to happen this beautiful day, Lord God. This is the day that you've given us, Lord, and we will rejoice, Lord God, and we will see, Lord God, your faithfulness. We will see your goodness today, Lord. Speak like only you know how, Lord God. Our ears are attentive to hear what you want to say, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. You guys may be seated in God's presence, but you don't have to be seated. If you're feeling what God is speaking to you today, you can feel free to respond. Just because we're in COVID-19 and we're wearing masks doesn't stop our praise, doesn't stop our shout, doesn't stop our, our engagement. Amen. You know, the last couple of weeks has been kind of weird. Should I speak? Should I sing? Should I? As long as you're six feet apart, you're good. Right? If you came with your family member and I say touch your neighbor, you can touch your family member. <laughs> Unless they don't like that. That's something else. But today I want to talk to you guys about what you do 
when you're running low. Anybody here running a little low on faith? We got some honest people here who are running a little low on faith. It's okay if we're running low as long as we have faith. You could be running low on faith, but as long as you have enough faith so that when Jesus passes your way, you can call out on him. You can call out on him. See, this particular incident about this blind man, there's uh, several of the apostles. Thank you, sir. It's amazing to have so many amazing serving people. When they see your shoelace untied or they just tuck it in for you. I'm blessed. <laughs> but there are several sort of um, views or lenses in this particular story. Um, if, if there's um, several of the other apostles talk about this particular story. One of them actually talks about two blind men. One of them actually names him and says uh, Bartimaeus. So it gives him a name. And one, one of them actually says that they're blind beggars. In other words, identify them by what they've been resoluted to doing, what they've been resorted to doing because of their condition. And here in the book of Luke actually just refers to him as a blind man, just refers to him as a blind man. And I think that one of the challenges of being blind and not having the ability to be able to physically see is that most of your decisions are based on secondhand accounts. Most of your decisions are based on someone else's discernment, someone else's judgment, someone else's opinion. And I believe that just like you can be physically blind, you can also be spiritually blind. You could also be mentally blind, where all of your decisions are based on someone else's discernment, based on someone else's judgment. And a lot of times, because we've disconnected ourselves with our relationship with God, sometimes we allow other people to make discernments for us. We allow other people to make judgments for us. And so we live a life of dependence. And this is the condition of this man. He's living a life of dependence. He's on the roadside because he's, he's begging. He's on the roadside because he's wanting someone else to be able to help him out of his situation. And sometimes spiritually, we can find ourselves in that rut when we're dependent on other people rather than being dependent on God. And I believe that in this season, we want, God wants us to shift from being dependent on other people to being dependent on God. To being de from being dependent on other people's opinions about everything that's going on to being dependent on the opinion and the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Being dependent on the Holy Spirit of God. And so sometimes it's fine to be able to be dependent as a blind person on another person's sort of leading when they have a clear view to the direction that they themselves know where they're going. But what happens when one, the one who is leading, is also astray themselves and they will end up leading us astray. And so it's sort of tough to be able to live your life based on someone else's interpretation. And I think a lot of times that's what Instagram and that's what Facebook and that's what social media has caused us to do is to live our lives dependent on somebody else's interpretation about the things that are going on around us. And I believe that God in this season really wants us to open up our spiritual eyes so we can discern for ourselves. God wants you to discern for yourself. And so many people, because of that, go through their lives never experiencing breakthrough because they're busy waiting for someone else's opinion, busy waiting for someone else to tell them what they should do about a particular situation, how they should feel about a particular situation. And so we end up living sort of like a beggar where we're dependent on someone else. And although this person, this beggar or this blind man was dependent on other people, I think that it's important to note here that he still had faith. He still had faith. You know why I know he had faith? Because there's another beggar that the Bible talks about, and it's in the book of Acts. It's one that is waiting in front of a church. Imagine, he's waiting in front of a church, the place where you're supposed to experience breakthrough, but he's waiting in front of a church, not to ask for a miracle, not to ask for healing, not to ask for a breakthrough, but simply to ask for money. 
Because he's lost his faith that God could do something about his situation. He's completely run out of faith. But this man right here, although he is by the roadside, he is positioned to be able to experience a miracle because when he hears that Jesus is around, immediately he calls on him. Immediately he calls on him. This is super important for us to note because he could have asked Jesus for a lot of things. He could have asked Jesus to give him provision, to be able to multiply food for him because maybe he was hungry. But rather than asking Jesus what he would normally ask somebody as far as for food, for money, or whatever it may be, he asked Jesus to have compassion on him, to have mercy on him, because he knew that Jesus could bring healing in his life. And maybe throughout the course of his life, he had faced different circumstances that have affected, that had affected his faith. It hadn't gone down to the point where he lost complete faith. And I wonder and ask myself, how did he get to the point where he had enough faith to ask Jesus for healing rather than ask Jesus for money? What brought him to that place where rather than asking Jesus for a handout, he asked Jesus for a hand up? And I think right now, when our faith is running low, it's important that just like this dude, we're understanding and we're clear about how do we build our faith? How do we build our faith? Because in the verse that we just read, it says that the victory that we have to overcome the world comes through faith. But what happens when I don't have any faith? to get the victory that I need. And it's good to know that I can overcome through faith, but what do I do when every ounce of faith that I've had in me has completely run out? What do I do when I've been in the midst of a situation that I've been asking God to change and I've been expecting a change and I've been expecting a shift, but nothing happens, nothing happens. What's going to happen if, God forbid, an October rolls around or the end of the year rolls around and they still don't have a vaccine? Will you have run out of faith? Will you have accepted that maybe this thing's not going to change? Maybe this is how life is going to look like moving forward. And I think it's important that in this season right now that when we're running low, we need to learn how do we build our faith? How do we build our faith? Because I just want to, I want to be able to overcome sometimes. I just don't know how to build my faith to be able to get through this season that I'm living in. And um, sometimes it's hard to, to be able to, to rebuild it. Um, anybody ever play Jenga? So the whole thing behind Jenga is that you sort of build this little tower, you just kind of build it, right? If it was pre-COVID-19, I would ask some volunteers to come and help me, but I'm trying to honor the six feet, so I'm going to try to do this one-handed. But this is how you, you know, play Jenga. You, you, you kind of build this little tower, but what happens is that as you build it, the whole point of the game is that you build it and build it, but you want to get to a point where you can start taking some of these blocks off without it falling out. You want to be able to take some of these off, you know. Um, these on the bottom, we would call foundational blocks, right? Because they're the blocks that hold the whole thing up, right? And we keep on building and we build. But this is what the enemy does oftentimes is that he will find little blocks that might not, hmm, I may have built this one wrong because I think that if I take this one out, I don't think that it will survive. And sometimes 
because we don't build our foundation the right way, one small thing happens in our life and the whole thing collapses. God wants us to build on a firm foundation. On a firm foundation, which means that I can go through stuff. I can go through circumstances. I can go through sickness. I can go through a pandemic. And the whole, my whole life won't fall apart because of it. Because I've established a strong foundation. I think right now in this season as believers, just coming to church on a Sunday is not a strong foundation. It's a good starting point. But we can't build on that. We've got to be able to build through a strong relationship with the Father. We've got to be able to build through a strong prayer life. And not just the prayer life, but be able to connect with other people who are like-minded. Other people who can build up our faith. Who can encourage us in our walk with Christ. So I believe that the reason why this guy had enough faith to ask Jesus for healing rather than ask Jesus for money or for food is because somehow he built his faith. He built his faith. So how how did he build his faith? How did he build his faith? Um, If you were to go to Revelation chapter 12 verse 11, it says that, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. I'm going to just kind of focus on that part right there. I know the verse has some more words there. But I just want to focus on this phrase for a second. Because I think it's very relevant to the situation this guy's facing. I think it's really relevant to our situation. The one we're facing right now. Because we're in the midst of a battle. We're in the midst of a physical battle. But we're also in the midst of a spiritual battle. We're in the midst also of an emotional battle. Some of you guys who might be business owners don't know what's going to happen. Is my business going to restart? Is it ever going to get back to the point where it was before? Is uh, my situation at my job ever going to get back to the place it was before? And so many different sort of uncertainties that we're facing and so many mental, emotional, and spiritual battles, we need to ask ourselves right now, how am I going to overcome We're not going to overcome simply because there's money in the checking account. We're not just going to overcome simply because of that. We're going to be able to overcome because our faith is founded in Christ Jesus. So again, I'm going to read this and see if we can get this. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and the testimony. So what this verse tells me, or part of this verse tells me, is that there are two things that God has given us to overcome. If you're writing notes, you want to take these two down. There are two things that God gives us to allow us to overcome. And the first of them is the blood of the Lamb. John 1.29, before Jesus even dies on the cross, John The Baptist sees Jesus from afar and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In other words, the first step in order for me to be able to overcome the world and overcome what the devil has done, the works of the devil, is to know That the blood of the lamb takes away all of my sins. No matter what sins they may have been in the past, what sins they may have been in the present, he takes away my sins. I don't know about you, but I'd be excited right now to know that whatever I did in my past, whatever I did last night, the blood of the lamb 
takes away my sins. When I know that, I mean, that means that I don't no longer have to walk around with shame. I no longer have to walk around with guilt. I no longer have to walk around with a lack of identity because now that I know that he takes away my sins, that means that I'm a son. That means that I'm a daughter. That means that I'm in relationship with him regardless of my past, regardless of my present struggles. I'm in relationship with the father because the son, the blood of the lamb takes away the sin of the world. The second thing, and I think it was very relevant to this blind man, is that we overcome by the power of testimony. Pastor, what do you mean about the power of testimony? Well, if you go to verse, back to verse 37, which we read a little while ago, it says, they told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And immediately it says that when he heard that Jesus was passing by, he called out. Now, first of all, he's blind. How does he know that Jesus can change his situation? How does he know that Jesus can change his life? How does he know that this is his moment to respond and begin to shout no matter what people say to him? And the only conclusion that I can come to is he must have heard stories about other people who were sick, about other people who were dead. I mean, people must have came up to him and told him, hey, listen, I know you've been blind most of your life, but there's this guy, this new guy in town, and when he comes and prays for people, and sometimes he does some freaky, unusual stuff, like he'll spit in your face and put dirt on it, and you'll be able to see. It's kind of freaky, it's weird, but they're get healed. Someone must have told him about the things that Jesus was doing. And somebody must have came up to him. Another person probably came up to him and, hey, listen, I heard last week Jesus was at a funeral. There was a little girl there who was dead. Everybody thought that was it. And Jesus outed everybody out kicked everybody out of the funeral home, and he brought her back to life. And all of a sudden, when his faith was running super low, it began to shift. It began to, to get filled. So he went from faith running on low to faith running on high. And the reason I know that is because when he hears that Jesus is passing by, no matter how much people try to shame him to shut up, he knows that this is his opportunity to receive a breakthrough that he needs. And the only reason he's been able to position himself for this miracle is because he's heard testimonies. Right now, in this season, you need to surround yourself, not with how many people, with people who are going to tell you the current news and how many cases there are and how, what's the death rate and all that stuff. That's all fine. We can be, you know, informed, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to call, allow what, that information to fill me with fear. And the more that I, I fill myself with that information, the more I fill myself up with all those different news of anti-testimonies, because that's what they are a lot of times, you know, because people, sometimes they love to give anti-testimony. What's an anti-testimony? I just made up a word. <laughs> when, when people come and share how many people died and how many people are suffering and, and, and we want to be compassionate to people's situation, because I know a lot of people here have experienced different levels of pain, but it's not something for me to sit there and dwell on. I'm going to hear it and listen to it, and I'm going to pray for God to strengthen and for God to bring forth encouragement and for those that have lost loved ones. But I need to also hear the miracles. I need to hear about the person who was in a ventilator for a month and was in a coma and was about to die, but somebody prayed for them and they came back to life. I need to hear about somebody who was at the point of death, but all of a sudden prayer came in and Jesus came in the room and they experienced a miracle in their life. Because I'm running out low and I need a testimony to once again refuel me. We need to be surrounded with people and maybe pour into people testimonies of what God has done in our life. And you're probably saying to yourself, hey, but pastor, I've never had to overcome any sickness. I don't have anything. Hey, how about that? You got a miracle right now. The fact that you didn't even contract it. 
the fact that you didn't get sick. Or maybe you did, but it wasn't as bad as it was somebody else. Hey, that's a miracle you can share with somebody. That's a testimony that you can share with somebody that would encourage somebody who's running low on faith. We have a whole generation, we have a nation that is running low on faith. They're running low on faith in our government. They're running low on faith on, in the church. They're running low on faith in so many different sectors of society and culture. But it is up to us to begin to call out. That's what this blind man did. Jesus was coming by, and as he was coming by, he began to call out. God is looking for some believers that in this moment, when they hear that Jesus is in the vicinity, they would begin to call out. When you sense the presence of God is in the midst of worship, you need to call out. It might look foolish. It might look stupid. But it might be the difference between you experiencing breakthrough or not. This is how he saw it. He saw this as his opportunity to be able to experience breakthrough. Somehow he heard about the stories that were going around. See, because he didn't have, he didn't have a problem with hearing. He had a problem with vision. He had a problem with seeing. He didn't have a problem with hearing. Where does faith come from? Huh, how about that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Sometimes part of us Building our faith is hearing testimonies, but also hearing the word of God. We've got to hear the word of God. As a matter of fact, there's a nap for that. You can throw it right on your phone, and while you're driving to work, when your faith is running on low on Monday morning because you're tired of doing the same new norm that we're doing over and over again, and you're wondering, when's this thing going to get over? When am I going to have to be able to go back to my normal life? How about if you put the Word of God on so you can begin to build your faith? Build your faith. Build your faith. Build your faith, faith. Because if we don't have the word of God, we often live in darkness to what God has for us, to what God wants to deposit inside of us. See, one of the biggest things the enemy likes to do is because he knows he can't take away God's promises, because he knows he can't stop God from working in your life. He knows he can't stop, he, he can't nullify what God has done for you on the cross of Calvary, what he did through the blood of the lamb and how he erased your sins. And since he can't nullify that, you know what he tries to do? He tries to keep you in the dark from that. He tries to keep you blinded. Uh, in, in Corinthians, it says that he has blinded non-believers so that they do not see the light of the gospel in Christ Jesus. And he wants to keep us in darkness. Because when we're in darkness, we can't see. And although we might be able to physically see, sometimes when we can't spiritually see, we miss out on what God wants to do right now. We miss out on the moments when he's passing through rather than asking God to bring a breakthrough we're just asking God for a handout and so I don't want to miss the next time Jesus is in the house I don't want to miss that opportunity to experience spiritual freedom a lot of times when you're in darkness there's so many things that we don't see like we, we don't see hope we don't see God's promises. We don't see God's love. We don't see the plan that he has for us. And, and oftentimes the enemy wants to keep us in that darkness. So I want to encourage you today as I get ready to close out. I want to encourage you today to do two things. Find opportunities to either receive a testimony or share a testimony. Receive a good report, share a good report. Receive a good report. And sometimes that means that you have to begin to ask God to help you discover what he's already doing in your life. 
See, because even in the midst of a famine, even in the midst of a pandemic, he's doing miracles. Even in the midst of all that, he's still doing signs and wonders. And sometimes we miss it. Because why? We're focused on what he's not doing. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to focus on what he's not doing. You know why he wants to do that? Because he wants you to build a case against God. He wants you to build a case of resentment. He wants you to build a case of bitterness. He wants you to build a case of unbelief. But if I shift my eyes from what he hasn't done and begin to look at what he is doing, all of a sudden I go from running low to running in the overflow. Where not only do I have enough faith for me, but all of a sudden I have enough faith to share with somebody else. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I would imagine, I would imagine that whatever town this guy was living in, that all the time that he was sitting there by the roadside and they would see him, and the next time that they came by the roadside and they're like, where's Barty at? I haven't seen Barty in a while. Like, he usually, that's his corner. That's his spot right there. Because, you know, they, a lot of times they have a spot, you know. They, that's their spot. Like, nobody can come. I haven't seen him in a while. You, you didn't hear about what happened with Barty? Nah, what happened? Man, this thing is all over Twitter and everything. Over Instagram, they took a picture. I'm just messing with y'all. Some of y'all are like, I didn't see that in the Bible. It's the 2020 version. But he's like, you didn't hear about what happened to Barty. Barty, one day Jesus was coming by and Barty shouted out to him. Everybody told him to shut up because they were tired of him yelling every time somebody came by with money. But he wouldn't shut up. Barty was so filled with faith, he wouldn't shut up to the point that he got Jesus' attention. Jesus called him up, and he declared healing on him. And Barty's not begging anymore. Barty's now got a job. Barty's got a family now. Barty's got it together now. And all of a sudden, that person who's hearing that is like, wow, that God, Jesus did that in him. Hold on, I got some situations in my life that I believe Jesus can work in. I believe that Jesus can do a miracle in. So we need to go find where this Jesus is. You see how that happens? How when God begins to do something in your life and you begin to hear testimony after testimony, you go from running low to running in the overflow. This is how God wants us. And how amazing would it be for us to be running in the overflow in the midst of a pandemic. How peed off would the enemy be? How ticked off would the enemy be to see you, to see me running in the overflow of faith in the midst of a pandemic? That will completely confuse darkness. That will completely confuse his minions, his de demons, and all of his demonic forces. Because he'll be like, hold on a second. I took away their ability to be able to gather the way they want to gather. I took away the building. I took all these things away from them. But they're still sharing the faithfulness of God. They're still talking about the goodness of God. They're still sharing testimonies. They're still praying for healing. They're still praying for supernatural works of God. Like, what do I? have to do that will completely confuse the enemy because right now this is what the enemy wants us to do he wants us to stay running on low but I believe that this is the day where God wants us to shift from running on low to going into the overflow if God spoke to you today I want you to be on your feet can we make some vows today with God can we renew some vows? A few years back, me and my wife, we were married. We've been married uh, 15, well, 18 years now, but at the time it was 15 years. And even though when we first got married, we made a covenant and we made some vows with one another, I think sometimes as the years pass, we kind of forget them. So about four or five years ago, in our 15-year anniversary, come on, y'all, 15 years a lot of people said we wouldn't make it past two, including me. No, just kidding. 
kidding, y'all. <laughs> I'm just messing with y'all. But in our 15-year anniversary, we decided that we would make a vow renewal so we can remind each other about the commitment that we made to one another, so we could remind each other about the love that we said to each other in 2001. 2002. Well, we met in 2001. That's when we made the first commitment of engagement. I didn't mess up my years, y'all. Maybe some of y'all made a commitment to God five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And in the midst of everything that goes on in a relationship, you sort of lose focus of those vows. But today, can we make some vows to God? Can we make some vows to him today? Before I do that, right, can we do something just real quick? If you've never made a vow to Jesus, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity right now to, to, to say, you know what, today I surrender my life to you. If you're watching online, you're in person, all you got to do is a simple prayer. Just raise your hand, just raise your hand. Whoever wants to make a first, first vow to him. Maybe you want to surrender. Maybe you've been coming to church. Hey, man, I see hands lifted up. That's awesome. That's awesome. So with your hands lifted up, would you do this simple prayer with me? Say, Lord, help them out, church. I give my life to you. I ask you to cleanse my heart with your precious blood. Write my name in the book of life. Transform me with your Holy Spirit. From this day forward, I don't want to be the same anymore. I want to be a new person in Christ Jesus. If you just made that prayer, would you just give him a shout of amen? Isn't that awesome when, when we can bring people into the family of Christ, into the kingdom? So, so good. Now the church, we're, we're going to make some vows because maybe sometimes we forget about those vows. The first vow we're going to make is we're going to vow to honor the blood of the Lamb and what He did on the cross, okay? Father, we come before you right now. And today, Lord God, we reestablish vows to you. We make a vow today, Lord, to honor the power of the blood of your son, Jesus. How it washes all of our sins, how it takes away all of my shame, and how it takes away all of my guilt, Lord. And it gives me a new identity in Christ, Lord. Today, Lord, I vow to honor that. Lord, today I also make another vow. I make a vow that when I'm running low on faith, I will be refueled by the power of your word. I will hear your word. I will read your word. I will meditate on your word. Lord, and I make a vow to share what you've done in my life, to share what you're doing in my life, to refuel someone's faith, Lord God. Someone who might be running on low, that when they encounter me, rather than getting a bad report, they would get a good report. Rather than getting discouraged, when they see my post online, they're going to be encouraged because I'm sharing your testimonies. I'm sharing your faithfulness in my life, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in your church. Thank you, Father, that even in the midst of a pandemic, Lord God, we can live in the overflow, Lord. I'm just praying, Lord God, for your church to experience an overflow of faith, Lord God, an overflow, Lord, of your spirit, an overflow of your joy, an overflow of your peace, an overflow of your gladness, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, give him praise in your own words. Tell him how thankful you are.